pretty much sums it all up. Hello, welcome to the JW Thoughts channel. My name is Wally, and today I am finally being a good apostate. So the annual meeting was secretly leaked and many people had access to, and obviously there's been lots of videos on it, but I have not watched any of it whatsoever. And as you guys know, what I like to do is kind of give my raw take on these things as I watch them. So thank you so much for joining me. We're going to be looking at the 2021 annual meeting. For those of you that don't know, the annual meeting basically functions like a, um, like a launch for a company or something, whenever they're going to be introducing their new products or their new ventures or whatever, whatever they're working on, they kind of show it then. So a lot of times if there's any big changes in the doctrine or within the structure of the organization, all of those things will be announced at the annual meeting. So uh, usually you get some pretty interesting nuggets of information. Uh, this morning or yesterday, I think they released part one. So we'll see how long these videos turn out to be, but I'll try and keep them within, you know, the normal time of about 30 minutes or so, and then just release them in segments. Anyway, with all of that being said, don't forget to drop a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. Still, 60% of people that watch videos don't subscribe. I don't understand. Please don't be the 60%. Subscribe to the channel. Be very cool. ZZ's here. You probably already saw him when you hear his bell. Let's do this thing. Does the governing body know when Armageddon is going to come? Yes, we do. It's going to come right on time. We have full confidence in that, don't we? That Jehovah is going to bring about those earth-shaking events exactly on time. But there's something else that Jehovah has promised to provide at the proper time. Would you go in your Bibles? Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. And verse 45. Now here, Jesus posed this question. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. Truly, I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. Well, what did Jesus say here? He said he would appoint a faithful and discreet slave who would provide the spiritual food. But there's another important detail there. Did you notice it? He added at the proper time. All right, so Mark Sanderson, uh, he begins his talk talking about time and how Jehovah is the great timekeeper. He uses the illustration of someone that is looking or waiting for the rain to come for their crops, like a farmer. And he knows that the rain will come right on time and blah, 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 blah. Then he goes and talks about prophecy and how Jesus came right on time, according to the prophecy. I'm assuming he's talking about the 70 weeks of years that are 69 weeks of years. Haha, <laughs> funny number. And then also how in 1914, Jesus came invisibly uh, and that was right on time. So we won't get into all of those because some of those prophecies are a little hinky once you sort of dissect them a little bit. But then he goes on and he makes this little joke, which I think is really, really fascinating because here you have a governing body member. He is fully aware of the Watchtower's history with making predictions. He's fully aware and he sees letters and he, he, he knows, right? Anything that I have to say about the organization, this man already knows. Anything that was written in Crisis of Conscience, this man already knows all of this. It's very well documented and he knows it. So when he makes the joke, so do the governing body know when Armageddon is coming? Yes, right on time. 
I just think it's really, really funny that he just jokes about it because people's lives have literally been completely changed by previous leaders of this organization making claims and making statements that were wild and people selling their houses so they can pioneer, quitting their jobs so they can pioneer, and it's simply not coming true. So with full knowledge and knowing this, he's still more than happy to just joke about. It. So then he goes and talks about Matthew 24 where it mentions the faithful and discreet slave. And he says specifically in there, after he reads it, what did Jesus say? Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus was giving this illustration, right? He doesn't have the date 1919 in here. He doesn't say the words governing body. He doesn't say watchtower, Jehovah's Witnesses. And it's just an example of being ready, being prepared, and being a good slave, by the way. Uh, we won't get into that. But he's just giving that example, and then it also talks about, in what it says in Matthew, if he stops reading, but if you go to verse 48, it says, But if ever that evil slave says in his heart, My master is delaying, and he starts to beat his fellow slaves, and to eat and drink with the confirmed drunkards. The master of the slave will come on a day that he does not expect, and an hour that he does not know, and he will punish him with the greatest severity, and will assign him his place with the hypocrites, where there is a weeping and gnashing of his teeth. I think that's more applicable to Watchtower. If Jesus is coming invisibly and inspecting, I think he's going to judge very harshly people that are taking the Bible and making it say things it simply doesn't say. Uh, it's, it's the puppet Bible, and Jehovah's Witnesses are absolutely famous for doing this. A, a, a lot of religions do this, but they basically, the Bible was written in such a way where it's vague, and it uses a lot of language that's a bit flowery and a lot of illustrations. So it lends itself to that, but it's not the Bible's fault. It's the people that are trying to say, oh, well, I understand what this poem really means. I understand what this illustration really means. And I think if there is a Jesus and he is in heaven and he is judging and picking an organization and he is looking for someone... When it says, my master is delaying, and he starts to beat his fellow slaves. I think that's what Watchtower absolutely does. They want to impress the most ridiculous rules. What are you doing? <laughs> On all of the ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses. And they'll even, if something doesn't make sense, even if something within the governing body, they don't quite believe it. And there's a disagreement within the governing body about, you know, should we teach this? Should we not teach this? If it's divided 50-50, they'll just go along with it. And you think, wait, if a ordinary witness also disagrees with something that, you know, the governing body is saying, but part of the governing body disagrees with it, they get kicked out of the organization. This is absolutely the evil slave, if there was anything to be said about this scripture. But really interesting about the joke and how he goes and talks about Matthew 24. Um, I know the format of this might be a little bit choppy because I'm going to probably end up talking a little bit more than they are talking. And I'll try and chop things up as uh, expeditiously as possible. So we'll see how it goes. But anyway, let's go on to the next section. Well, because of Jehovah's perfect sense of time. He knows exactly what his people need, and he knows exactly the right time to provide it. Now, just consider a couple of examples of this. Just as World War II was erupting, the November 1st, 1939 issue of the Watchtower featured an in-depth discussion of the topic of neutrality. That timing was absolutely perfect. Because of those articles, our brothers worldwide knew exactly what to do as the war engulfed the entire planet. So he does something subtle here that I thought I should at least point out. 
And that is through the whole context of this talk. He's talking about how Jehovah is the great timekeeper. And then he moves from Jehovah to the faithful slave, providing the spiritual food at the proper time. And then he gives a specific example of a watchtower that was given uh, during World War II. So people knew what they were meant to do whenever they needed to take a stand uh, or their neutrality as far as their place they lived was concerned. And he cites this 1939 uh, issue of the Watchtower. So what he's doing here is he's making this transition from Jehovah's the Great Timekeeper to the Faithful and Discreet Slave, which is now the governing body, to a specific example of them producing information that was right on time. And this is something I find really interesting because what he is suggesting here, and you can't change my mind otherwise, what he's suggesting here is that they are inspired by God, that they are tools for God to distribute God's message and God's will. So that way people will know what to do. And it was perfectly on time. And when he makes that claim in the face of the a governing body member officially going on record as saying, well, we don't think we are inspired of God. We think it's presumptuous to say we are God's mouthpiece. I think that's really fascinating. So in, in this situation, the governing body is feels completely free to go from Jehovah to Jesus illustration to me and make that transition and look how great and right on time the information that me and my buddies produce in New York. Whereas when it's an official statement, uh, perhaps before someone that's an authority figure within the country they are, and is questioning them on the stand in a legal sense, they're like, well, that would be a little presumptuous to say. I find it so interesting how they can talk out of both sides of their mouths. And honestly, it's, it's dishonest because this guy knows it. And if he's unaware of the dichotomy that he's creating, then he's either a bumbling fool or I guess a malicious person. Maybe I guess we'll just, we'll tell him he's a bumbling fool at best. So there you go, Mark. You're a bumbling fool at best. Well, after the war, as the organization was rapidly growing, Jehovah's organization arranged large international conventions that were held in New York City. In 1958, a quarter of a million people, can you imagine, overflowed Yankee Stadium and the Polo Grounds. Were any of you there? Well, it's so wonderful. We still have a few people there. <laughs> it's not that I wasn't in the truth at that time. It's just I wasn't in the world at that time. <laughs> Another example, seconds apart, of him laughing. Just laughing. Oh, were some of you serving Watchtower all the way back then? <laughs> That's hilarious. It's not funny. These people are going to be in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and they've been serving this organization that's done nothing for them. I mean... If you want to make the argument, oh, well, it's given them community. Oh, it's given them family. Oh, it's made them become a better person. Yes, all of those things could be true without the deleterious things that happen as a Jehovah's Witness. So it's a non-argument. And here they're just laughing about it. He's in a room full of people that, I mean, he can pause at any moment and just do this. And people will laugh. Don't make any, don't delude yourself into thinking that this man can't just stop talking and go, at near, he could be like, grass. And people would start laughing. Table. People would start laughing. So don't, don't listen to their laughter too closely. But it is funny that he's laughing at other people dedicating their entire lives. People older than him that have just been going on with this organization. And he thinks it's just a big joke. I personally don't. Well, fast forward 
to 2020, and a time when the world was engulfed in a global pandemic. Large gatherings were prohibited in most countries. Could we go to Yankee Stadium and have 250,000 people? No, but right on time. Jehovah guided the faithful and discreet slave so that our worldwide brotherhood could enjoy the convention program from home. Truly, spiritual food at the proper time. Did the governing body invent broadcasting? Did the governing body invent streaming? Did they pioneer any new technology that made this possible? How on God's green earth, I guess unless you live in a desert, but how on God's green earth do they sit there and say, well, right on time, you know, Jehovah directed his organization so they could have the the tools to put out the convention from the comfort of everyone's home. They didn't do that. I mean, they, they, they simply didn't do that. So, so now the governing body, they're taking credit for things that they don't even do. Someone else develops the technology in order to accomplish something, and they say, oh, it's right on time for Jehovah's Organization to be able to use this new technology. Huh? You didn't do anything about that. You just were adapting to what Satan's system is doing. It, that's really funny to me. It's kind of like when they talk about all the things with... Um, I mean, with the translation, at least they were kind of sort of pioneers in a certain sense um, of trying to develop technology for that. So credit where credit's due, for sure. But for other stuff like making videos and JW.org, like... I, hey, maybe I'm the faithful and discreet slave because I make videos and another platform helps me to distribute them. Woo! And with so many wonderful things happening in the field, I'm sure that you're all wondering about our worldwide memorial attendance for 2021. Well, by the undeserved kindness of our amazing God, Jehovah, we have reached an all-time peak, crossing the 21 million mark. Would you like to know the exact figure? Well, keep on the watch. It'll be announced today at the proper time. <laughs> this guy's so proud of himself. He is... He, he, Maybe we'll, we'll just, right here, we'll just put a, a quick little snapshot of his face. <laughs> this guy's so proud of the joke that he made. <laughs> just seeing him laughing like a, like a toddler, uh, it was actually kind of adorable. Because <laughs> he was so excited. It's like what a, what a two-year-old comes up to you and is like, what did one ocean say to the other way, ocean? Oh, nothing. It just waved. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the equivalent of that in my mind. But it is interesting that uh, he does pick up on this one statistic. So if you haven't watched the video about, I did a video on the service report and I actually went back for like the last 20 years and just looked at some of the more interesting aspects of that. But the one thing I didn't include in there was memorial attendance or memorial partakers because I didn't want to get into that and the video was already pretty long in and of itself. So just that whole thing would have been, it would have ballooned, ballooned. Wow, I can't even speak English. Ballooned out of proportion. And it is, hi Zizi. It is funny that he picks up on this one statistic and says, hey, when we were holding our Zoom meetings, uh, for the memorial, we had an all-time attendance of 21 million, over 21 million. Ignoring the fact that since about 2014, 20, or 2015, the Watchtower can't even match just the birth-death ratio. They're starting to dip below that. And he's sitting here thinking, wow, we had... 21 million people at the memorial this year. 
Well, yes, you're going to have those people that still believe in the Watchtower, but are inactive, that grew up in the Watchtower, but didn't really do anything, and they didn't leave the organization necessarily for the right reasons, but they're still out of it, just living their lives. And the fear response of some major global event is immediately going to be like, oh no, I need to go back to the Kingdom Hall, I need to make sure I do the memorial, because it is the most important year our day of the year, and I need to make sure I celebrate this. Anyway, it's a bunch of hogwash. <laughs> but I did think it was really funny, uh, just how proud he was that of his little joke here. So, so shout out to Mark Sanderson. Good job. You're you're the equivalent of an adorable two year old, but you're a grown man that's controlling eight million people. So maybe it's creepy, not adorable. Next. Well, no doubt many of you are experiencing similar blessings as you are conducting Bible studies in this wonderful new tool. If you're not presently conducting a Bible study, why not make it a matter of earnest prayer to Jehovah? Because there's no experience quite like having a Bible study in this wonderful new publication. So they play like a nine, 10 minute video just about uh, this new Bible study uh, publication that they released this year. And it's pretty unremarkable, so I'm not, I don't really have too much to say about it, but they're talking about how great it is and how Bible students are enjoying it and teachers are enjoying it. But at the end of the day, you have to look and say, okay, well, is this effective? Is this new method actually bringing in more people? No, it, it's, it's really not. The door-to-door -door work, I think, is getting pretty close to dead. Because you're going, you just with how the numbers are looking and how they've been looking for a long time now, Watchtower is declining. And I think they're just going to continue to do that until some major thing happens where they're going to have a hardening, a reset. It'll be like the transition from Russell to Rutherford. And a lot of people will leave. Some people will stay. Maybe it's like 70, 30, who knows? And the people that do stay will just be, you know, preaching this, whatever the new version of Watchtower will be. That's kind of what I have in my head. But anyway, it's pretty insignificant. Yay, they have a new publication. Now we get to hear about Caleb and Sophia. So that's pretty cool. Let's see about it. Hey, Sophia, we know you're in there. Please, Jehovah, make it stop. <laughs> what a loser. Let's go. All right, class. Today we're going to discuss Sophia, you're late. I'm sorry. Uh, I was... Never mind. We'll talk about this later. Ooh. Okay, okay. That's enough. Sophia, take your seat. Today, we're going to discuss the difference between division and long division. <gasps> Okay, class, here are the results from yesterday's test. Good work, Sophia. Hey, Angela, what you get? I don't care. Whoa, D plus? Well, at least there's a plus. Whatever. What are you looking at? Uh... <laughs> See you there. It's like you're invisible. <laughs> oh, 
what's this? No! See you tomorrow. They pick on me too. So, a common feature in the Caleb and Sophia series is the depiction of non witness children. And it's always, always going to be that they are the meanest nastiest kids um that you can possibly imagine just breaking stuff for no reason bullying talking bad about people you know crunching up her tests what are you looking at and the other kid is like well the, what grade did you get <laughs> so it's just like the typical example of how the witnesses see the outside world but i do find it amazing and how consistent they are and how from a very early age because you have to remember there's going to be jehovah's witness toddlers watching this regularly perhaps more than they watch just nickelodeon or spongebob or whatever but they're going to be watching this from a very early age so they are going to grow up with this perception of the world and the perception is, it's evil, it's scary, people are bad, I cannot hear out of the left side of my ear. And the right side is ringing. That is very weird. Anyway, um, yeah, so there's always that perception, and it's really scary and sad that witnesses grow up with this just pure indoctrination from such an early age. You need to be scared of the world. And then it comes in other you know, different avenues later on in life. But the theme is very clear and you can't really deny it and be scared of Satan's system. Everyone is bad. It was amazing. And then Miss Wilson said that I could hold the bunny, but I had to be very gentle. Really? I named him Fred, but I didn't get to hold him for very long. I'm pretty much a bunny expert now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is everything all right, honey? Um, see you tomorrow. I'm fine. Okay, let's talk about something very important. Prayer. Caleb, what are some things that you can pray for? Well, I can pray for things that make me happy. Like a helicopter. Or a mountain of ice cream. Uh, without the belly ache. Fred! I see. But tell me, when we pray before bedtime, what do we pray for? We thank Jehovah for the good things he made, like, like animals, the stars, and the ocean. And God's kingdom. And to help our brothers and sisters. That's right. You can pray for your brothers and sisters. And remember, they are praying for you too. We know that when we pray for the right things, Jehovah hears us. Then why doesn't he answer my prayers? Oh, what's wrong, Sophia? You can tell us. There's a girl at school. She's so mean to me. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, honey, it's okay. I prayed for it to stop, but nothing's happened. Is Jehovah mad at me? No, my dear. 
Jehovah isn't mad at you. Maybe Jehovah can't see me. No. <laughs> All right, fair warning. If you don't like hearing my opinions on uh, the usefulness, <laughs> the usefulness of beliefs, apparently Zizi doesn't like hearing my opinions. But if you don't like that, fast forward for three minutes because I'm going to go on a bit of a rant. And here we go. For those of you that have stayed, this is absolutely the equivalent of a kid hearing that there's no Santa Claus. Oh, there's no Santa Claus. And he's crying. He's like, but I thought... And the parents double down. Like, we don't buy you those gifts. I know. Don't don't be fooled. There is a Santa Claus. This is like the the the, the, El the Grinch or whatever. I can't remember exactly. Was it the Elf, Elf or the Grinch? W one of those movies. But they feed into a child's delusion. So... A, a, a slick move by the parents for the tooth fairy or for the Easter bunny or the, or Santa Claus. And the, the, the kid finally is old enough. I, I don't know how old she's meant to be, but she's becoming aware enough of the, her surroundings in the world when she's like, maybe God doesn't hear me. Maybe this is a perfect time <laughs> to just comfort her by saying you know you actually don't have to worry about that because it's not real you don't have to stress about it but no they double down and they grab a dr seuss book and say hey look in this old book it says that someone else felt just like you but don't worry you should still believe and you should have faith that santa claus will bring you presents and you're not going to get that lump of coal it's absolutely despicable. Now, I know that's not the perfect illustration, obviously, because the parents know that um, Santa Claus doesn't exist and they're purposefully deceiving. But I think the whether you're purposefully deceiving your child or you're mistakenly deceiving your child, at the end of the day, you're still deceiving your child. So put a tent intent to one side and ask yourself, how is this different? And it's absolutely despicable that this guy's about to i mean i know this is all fictitious anyway but this is pretty close to how it would go i find it particularly despicable that they've chosen this moment to double down and continue to have this girl be scared because here's the funny thing not that funny she's never going to have her prayers answered she's never going to have a example a provable example of where oh yeah i prayed for something and it came true and if it did it's either chance or something that she did and effort that she put in herself. Okay, rant over. <laughs> there is someone in the Bible who felt the same way you do. Her name was Hannah. Hannah loved Jehovah very much. But someone named Penina was very mean to her. It's so nice to see the children play, isn't it? She had a bully too? Yes. We're ready to eat. Here's your portion, Hannah. And Penina, here's yours. She was very jealous of Hannah. Uh, I'll get some water. You think you're so special, Hannah? <laughs> then why hasn't Jehovah given you any children? Are you okay, Hannah? <laughs> why are you so sad? Others could not understand why Hannah was so upset. Because the pain was in her heart. So she talked to the one who would understand. <laughs> oh, Jehovah, please see me. Remember me 
and do not forget me. Please, give me a child. If you do, I will give him to you all his life to serve you. So let's put the narrative that a parent can basically choose the life for their child to one side. Because that's kind of messed up. But we'll just put that to one side for now. And look at what's going on here just from a, uh, a perspective of God answering prayers. Because that's what the whole thing is about. God answers your prayers when you ask him for something, but then dedicate that same thing directly to him. God only will answer your prayers when there's something that he gains from it. So, Zizi's drinking my coffee now. Okay. Uh, I know coffee's bad for cats. He likes a little bit. It's fine. Anyway. <laughs> You've completely ruined my train of thought, Zizi. Thank you very much. Anyway. So why doesn't God just come in and say, hey, I see you're going through a terrible time. Hey, I recognize and understand you're one of my faithful servants. Let me help you. I will give you this. It's only once she says, you know, please, if, if you give me a child, then I'll dedicate his entire life to you. He'll, he'll be yours. Hey, uh, boss, can you give me a bonus? If you give me a bonus, I promise I'll just give it right back to you. But everyone else got a bonus, and it made me feel bad that I didn't get one, so I'll, I'll give the money right back to you if you give me one. Okay. It, it makes absolutely no sense. And this is how young Jehovah's Witnesses are going to start thinking about their relationship to God, Jehovah, whatever you want to call it. They are going to start thinking of it in terms of, I need to give something if I want to get something. Uh, I don't know if you can even see me at this point, but uh, yeah, I, I can't really tell. But anyway, that's the point. Let's move on. Thank you, ZZ. You're very helpful. What are you doing? Why are you drunk? I'm not drunk. I'm under great stress. Oh. I've been praying for Jehovah to help me. Go in peace. And may Jehovah give you what you've asked for. <sighs> Do you know why Hannah felt better, even though her prayer wasn't answered yet? Why? Because Hannah knew Jehovah heard her prayer. When Jehovah listens to your prayers, he really listens. And he knows just what we need, even better than we do. But how does he answer them? In lots of different ways. Sometimes we just have to wait and see. Because he's busy? No, because it can be hard for us to see the answer. Let's talk about what you can pray for. And what you can do tomorrow at school to work along with those prayers. And there you have it, the real message. Let's see what you can do. Let's see what you can do about the situation. That's what they are calling prayer. Okay, pray about this, but don't expect, you know, your prayer to be heard or answered or anything. You need to do something about the problem that you're praying for. Huh? Huh? If you... <laughs> if someone comes up to me and says, Hey, can I have $5? And I say, Well, yes, I will give you $5 by showing you how you can earn $5. I, I mean, I guess that's probably a bad illustration. <laughs> because, well, damn, I really closed myself in here. Maybe God is answering prayers correctly then. Hey, you know, I've been wrong this whole time about, about prayer. God is only merely teaching us lessons about how we can make $5. And uh, he's that, that's how he's answering it. He's showing us. He's guiding us. Even though he doesn't actually guide us and show us. Oh yeah, okay, we'll bring it home. So then you're like, okay, I'll give them $5. 
and then you don't actually show them. They come up with a way on their own. You come back a week later and say, hey, did you get that $5? And they're like, yeah, I, I mowed someone's lawn and they gave me 20 bucks actually. And like, wow, look how great it was that you asked me for $5. Hey, look, my terrible illustration, we brought it all home. I probably should cut this all out, but I'm too lazy, so help me, please. I know that Angela and the other girls are going to be mean to me. But please help me to be like Hannah tomorrow. Help me to be strong like her. And then she went to the tabernacle and Eli was there. He was the high priest. That's right, worldly kids. They clean their glasses, eat candy, and listen to music. How disgusting. Oh no, it's them, run! Look who it is. What do you want, Angela? Oh, I was just wondering if you had a pen I could borrow. <laughs> What do I do? Jehovah heard her prayer. Jehovah, it's me, Caleb. Please help, Sophia. And please help Sophia be strong at school today. Watch over the children in our congregation, like Caleb and Sophia. Please watch over our children. Help our children make you proud, Jehovah. Please, Jehovah, give our children the strength they need to face Jehovah, prayer. Jehovah, please, I need your help. We ask you this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I've always wondered how prayer works, and now, thanks to Watchtower's brilliant uh, animation team, I finally understand it. You have to jump into some sort of portal realm, which looks a lot like Doctor Strange, so Benedict Cumberbatch is over here uh, praying and doing the little and they go through the portal and uh, the words from your mind, they go through the portal and they reach uh, Jesus or oh God, because Jesus doesn't answer prayers, only God does, sitting on his throne, which Jesus is sitting on the throne. And they, uh, they reach him in all of these little tiny droplets. <laughs> uh, I've, I know I've talked about this before on the episode I did on prayer, but just to reiterate, if you're saying that this little girl um, needs help because of a bully in school and that the the quantitative effect of multiple people praying to help the children and her and her parents and her brother all praying about this issue yield to or yields a result then you have to answer the question why do so many horrible things happen to believers why can a volcano erupt and it fundamentally changes the landscape in a country and they don't have access to clean water? They don't have access to food or crops or anything. And thousands of people die. And there are people praying for them. And yet, is that prayer answered? Well, it's answered in the form of hey, let's see what sort of humanitarian organizations are interested in helping the cause. Let's see if we can use the global community in order to help people that are currently disadvantaged. How is that an answer to the prayer? This whole concept that they are providing is that, hey, 
Lots of people are praying about it. Let's God will move to action. But you have to answer then, well, lots of people are praying about horrible, horrible things. And on God's list of things, hmm, stop this person from bullying or stop thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of children from starving to death or dying of a disease because they don't have access to clean water. What is going to be God's priority? Sorry, I'm worked up, so we'll just bring ZZ in here. I don't think he wants to make an appearance. Oh, I guess there you go. Men. What? Are you gonna cry? <laughs> Stop, Angela. You're being mean. And if you keep being mean, I'm going to tell. No, you won't. Yes, I will. You can't tell me what to do. Let's go, Zoe. My sister. You're so brave. How did you do that? I prayed for courage and Jehovah helped me. Hannah gave birth to a son and named him Samuel because, as she said, it is from Jehovah that I have asked him. There is no one holy like Jehovah. There is no one but you. <sighs> Thank you, Jehovah. In some ways, this is like a father that aban abandons his, his kids and his family, but calls them like, once a week or once a month or once every year or something. And uh, the kids, you know, they're are, are raised by the mom and they're doing really good and they're good people and honest and, and trying to do the right thing. And they face some sort of problem and, you know, they talk to their dad about it. He's like, well, just make sure you do the right thing. And then he hears that they do the right thing. And then he sits back. He's like, ah, I'm such a great father. I told them to do the right thing and they did. Look at me go. I am such... Huh? You didn't do anything. You abandoned your family. And this is the equivalent of what God has done. He's just abandoned people to figure it out on their own. He never shows up to answer any of these prayers. And then people just credit him for doing something when he hasn't done anything at all. It's absolutely bizarre to me that they can say look i i had courage and i stood up to a bully and i did this and that yeah you did that and you should you should take credit for that because that guy that your father that you're talking to on the phone once a week or once a month he didn't do anything he literally did absolutely nothing you did it you take credit for it and also call him out for not doing more for actually being a part of your life for actually contributing in some meaningful way anyway caleb and sophia video done let's see what's next incredible that's the only way to describe it the word had gone out that the jews who had been captives in Babylon, were free to leave and to return to their homeland, Israel. Now, you all know why that was incredible. Because Babylon never released its captives. But Babylon had been overthrown, and the new administration had said that the Jews were free to go. Only Jehovah could have been responsible for that. Yes, Cyrus the Great, son of Cambyses or something. I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> he set the he he let the Jewish people go home and uh, rebuild their walls and all that good stuff. Um, Babylon never let any of their captors go, and only by Jehovah was this allowed to happen. 
Let's just ignore the... Uh, it's easy. Oh, my lord. Let's just ignore uh, what Cyrus the Great actually had a habit of doing, of what he's kind of famous for, of freeing people, of incorporating people instead of making them slaves. No, 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 no. Let's just ignore that that was his policy, and let's focus in and say... Only Jehovah could have done this. I swear, this new crop of governing body members don't have anything new or original to say, so they just, like, take something and they just blow it out of proportion all the time. I, I don't... I literally can't even understand the mind of someone that says Babylon would never let their people go. Yes, they were overthrown uh, by, I don't, does he even name Cyrus? Or, anyway, whatever he says. But, uh, only by Jehovah were they let go. Uh, actually, it was because of the ruler at the time in the area that they were let go. It was kind of his policy, and it worked out really good for him. Oh, uh, David, explain. I'm sure this is going to be a real doozy. And I haven't actually watched this, by the way, and so these are just, like, my first reactions. So if I'm getting stuff super-duper wrong, or if I'm saying stuff that they're going to talk about later, then I do apologize. Every family head had a decision to make. To leave Babylon, or to stay behind. Now, you might say, there was no decision to make at all. That's not a hard decision. But wait, hold it. Most of the Jews had been born in Babylon, and most of their parents had been born in Babylon. It was the only home they knew. Their roots were there. And uh, according to certain records, uh, some of them had got prosperous. Some of them had got wealthy. There are records of Jews buying and selling precious gems and other luxury items. I'm sorry, Mr. Splain, but I don't know if you should be talking about ancient Babylon records. Because I feel like, and maybe it's just me, and maybe I'm going crazy, but I feel like there is something that you might want to hide in your theology. Just maybe an important date or a timeline that seems kind of made up and is 100% disproven if you look at the Babylon records that were recorded at the time. But you know, it, it's fine. We'll just, we'll just let them have it and, uh, and use it as a point to say, Hey, look, I am giving you this new biblical insight because I've looked at these Babylonian tablets and, and records and, oh my goodness, what record keepers they were. And wow, look, we can learn this. Some of them were quite wealthy. Imagine how challenging it would have been to leave their comfortable life. We kind of see where he's going here. <laughs> so they'll use <laughs> these records for one thing. And yet, when another thing that these same records will clearly, like, there's no dispute about it, prove, we'll just ignore that one. <laughs> so what's the name? What's the special name of this highway? The Way of Holiness. Isn't that a nice name for a highway? Rattlesnakes, bears, foxes, and cougars are not allowed. I don't care how cute you think they are, they're not allowed on this special highway. Uh, so I cut a fair amount of this out because it is fairly unremarkable. Uh, just to catch everyone up on the speed, he's basically talking about when they're going from Babylon back to their homeland, how Jehovah in Isaiah promised that they would have a highway of holiness, a highway that was safe and easy for them to access so they could get back. But I did want to include this clip because one thing I did notice in this section uh, that happened multiple times, you can go back and watch the original if you want, but it did happen. He tries to make a joke and no one laughs. And it's really funny to me, and I know I, I probably point this out more than I should, but whenever a governing body member does the you know, make their little joke and they wait. 
I don't think David Splane waits long enough so he doesn't actually get the laughs. Like, Tony Morris will just sit there and be like... <laughs> he'll just sit there and wait for, like, 30 seconds until he gets his laugh. David Splane, though, he'll wait, like, a second, maybe two. And if the laugh doesn't come immediately, he just, like, moves on. So I don't know if he's more self-aware or if he feels bad that his joke didn't work i i don't really know the whole psychology behind it but anyway just catching you guys up on the lore and uh i thought that was funny because he made a joke and he's like i don't care how cute you think they are not allowed here crickets okay uh next point moving right along now what else can we learn about this special highway uh, today you don't know who's traveling in the car next to yours it could be somebody who has no business driving a car. The driver could be drunk. He could be on drugs. But on this highway, the unclean one is not permitted. Those who would break God's laws are not permitted to travel on that highways. Well, we're talking about the highway between Babylon and Jerusalem, and no doubt unclean ones among the Jews wouldn't be interested in going back to Israel anyway. Uh, they were probably very much at home with the idolatry of Babylon. Remember, their forefathers were no strangers to idolatry. So only those who were clean and acceptable in Jehovah's eyes were welcome to travel from Babylon back to Jerusalem. I might completely put my foot in my mouth here, but correct me if I'm wrong, good people of YouTube. Wasn't David Splain the one that went on the broadcast talking about how they're moving away from the type, anti-type, whatever model that they used previously. So like books like the Revelation book, I don't look too closely into that because that used a lot of type. Anti-types, that's not really necessarily how we're supposed to be reading the Bible. And I am fairly confident, as someone that watches a fair amount of uh, Watchtower propaganda, that this man is about to make some sort of correlation to the modern day, and he's going to do the type anti-type. I could be wrong on this, but uh, uh, validate me if I'm correct or scold me if I'm wrong. But I'm pretty sure he's the one that went on the broadcasting say, yeah, we don't really look into the type anti-type thing. And I'm, I am very confident that he is about to go in and <laughs> say, now what does this mean for us today? <laughs> so I paused it here. We'll all learn together. We'll see if Wally's a, a genius or if he's an idiot. So, uh, well, I guess we already know that answer. So now what have we learned? What have we gleaned from this series of scriptures? First, there's a highway, a highway through the desert. We've also learned that it's to be cleared of obstacles. It has a special name, the, the way of holiness. And there were, to re, there were to be signposts so that those who traveled the road wouldn't get lost and maybe stray on to some other road. Now, what was the goal? Why did Jehovah want this road to be prepared so nicely? To make it as easy as possible for the Jews to leave Babylon and go back to Israel and reestablish pure worship. I am doubling down. He is going to find some modern-day comparison. I absolutely guarantee it. If he doesn't, in the next shot, I will go into the bathroom and paint all of my fingernails pink. So I will have pink fingernails on the next shot if he doesn't make a modern day correlation. That's how convinced I am. Man, I hope I'm right, because I really don't want all of my nails to be pink. But we'll see. Did it work? Tens of thousands of men, women, and children responded to the, to the call, the invitation, and with Jehovah's help, they arrived safely at their destination. Well, you might be thinking this is all very nice, but what does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with us today? It's so good being right. <laughs> it's a fake cigar, by the way. I'm not promoting smoking YouTube. It's fake, see? It's plastic. I have to cover my bases. <laughs> I just knew he was going there. So uh, no pink nails for Wally today. Plenty. Because today, not tens of thousands, but millions of men, women, and children are responding to the command, the urgent command, 
get out of her. Get out of Babylon the Great. And the situation is different from the situation of the Jews in ancient times because they had a choice. They could remain in Babylon and still serve Jehovah. But people today have no choice. They must leave Babylon the Great. Their life depends on it. Now, without looking for a type, an anti-type, and trying to fit everything in very neatly uh, in this uh, arrangement, and we can say that there are some similarities between what happened to the Jews in ancient times and what is happening today. <laughs> oh, it's just so great listening to these because <laughs> I think a lot of us are like 10 steps ahead of where they actually are going to be. And it is very satisfying when you have like this leader of millions of people and you know exactly what he's going <laughs> to say before he says it. <laughs> And then he says, now we're not going to look for a type, anti-type sort of situation here, but we'll just look for similarities in there. So instead of looking for type, anti-type, we'll just say, let's, fi <laughs> let's find the things that make it similar <laughs> and ignore the things that make it different. <laughs> So what this scripture is really talking about, or how it's beneficial to us, is because of the similarities. Now, those things that it's not similar, no, don't, don't really think about that. This guy is speaking to millions of people, and he is not really thinking about these illustrations. That, that's like me. I give these illustrations off the top of my head, and we had one earlier, and they start not making sense. And as I'm talking and ranting and rambling then sort of bringing them all home and bringing them together. But this guy, he's having a prepared speech that he's been working on, no doubt, for at least weeks, if not months. And it's going to be out in front of 8 million people. And I promise, if I had millions of people, I would probably put a little bit more effort and thought into the thing that I was about to say, because I would want to make sure that it was accurate and it made sense and it, it was you know easy to listen to. <laughs> this guy's kind of just like me though he's like well oh we'll just ignore the things about my illustration that were terrible and uh just you know fit those all into one thing but uh, it has to be him because he did make the ant type anti-type comparison so i think my memory did serve me correctly there and that he was the one that well mentioned all of those things anyway let's uh see what similarities but no types or anti-types that we have to work with here well, Storrs knew that he didn't have the whole truth on every subject. And in 1847, he made quite an interesting statement. It'd be interesting for us. He says, We do well to remember that we have just emerged from the dark ages of the church. And notice this. It would not be strange if we should find some Babylonish garments still worn by us. Well, he was right. Um, Babylon, Babylon still had influence in those days. Well, we know that George Storrs had an influence on Charles Taze Russell. And what do we know about Brother Russell and his associates? All right, so just to catch everyone up to speed, he has this whole idea of this highway of holiness. And how do you build a highway? Well, you start with one shovel full of dirt at a time. And there could be even a mountain of ignorance in front of you. But in order to build the highway one shovel full at a time. So then he goes and talks about some of the history of the Bible of William Tyndale and Henry Grew and George Storrs and all of the same figures that the governing body are always mentioning, or I should say watchtowers always mentioning as being people that helped advance biblical truth. So now he's getting into Charles Taze Russell and seeing what uh, he has to say about Charles Taze Russell is very curious to me. So let's see what's going on. The last part was literally like 10 minutes, and we did that in like 30 seconds, so that's why we cut it out. They weren't the first to discover that the Trinity and the immortality of the soul are false doctrines, or even that Christ's presence would be invisible to the human eye. They benefited from the careful preparatory work that other road workers had done in the past. So, translators, printers, and Bible students were doing spiritual sight work. And we might say that Brother Russell and his associates put the final touches on that way of holiness. 
That just might be one of the biggest whoppers I have heard from Watchtower in a while. You know, he has this whole idea of building this highway to holiness, a highway to hell, I guess, ACDC. <laughs> and I'll just add the music in the background. And that it's basically complete with Charles Taze Russell. Yet the organization that we see today would be unrecognizable to Charles Taze Russell. Like literally almost every thing that he taught without maybe a few basic fundamentals would be something that a Jehovah's Witness believes today. Uh, I've been reading, what is it even called? Dawn of the Ages. Oh boy. Aid to Bible Understanding. I've been reading old books lately. The Finnish Mystery, Studies in the Scriptures, Bible... St you know the book I'm talking about. Studies in the Scriptures? Is that what it is? Anyway, I, I've been going through that, and I find it so amazing just how kooky the beliefs were of Charles Taze Russell. And they maintained a fair amount of kookiness even later on. And I, uh, today, they're still pretty kooky. But even by Jehovah's Witness standards... They would look at Charles Taze Russell and those early Bible students, and they would probably call that a cult. They would say, oh, no, they're just following a man. They're just following Charles Taze Russell. So it's funny that he can sit here or stand here knowing exactly the history of the organization. Because in order to be a governing body member, I, I would sure hope that you have a basic understanding of the history of Watchtower of the Bible students and of Jehovah's Witnesses and those early leaders of the of the church, of the organization of Russell, Rutherford, and Knorr, and then the transition to the governing body. So I think he would understand these things, and yet he just wants to do the thing he said, we're not looking for types or any types, we're just looking for similarities here. Hey, we can't make this all fit, but uh, gosh darn slap my knee, we'll make a few things fit. Okay, I'll get tongue. let's see what we got going on here. Y'all come back now, you hear? Why do we keep doing that? This isn't a thing. This isn't a new thing. It's not something I'm going to keep doing. Are you not entertained? Uh, this is probably the last time I'll ever do it, so cherish this moment. Well, Babylon the Great fell in 1919, and then the way of holiness was open for travelers. But Brother Russell died in 1916. Did he miss it? Did he miss the inauguration of the road? I don't think so. He didn't have a bird's eye view of the opening of the road. He had a heaven's eye view. Because Brother Russell and his associates, who had finished their earthly course, they were able to look down from the heavens. And can you imagine how excited they were when they saw the first travelers set foot on the way of holiness? It must have been very exciting for them, for them indeed. And it wouldn't be surprising if Brother Russell and his associates were firmly involved in the maintenance program of that way of holiness today. Because every good road needs ongoing maintenance. So it looks like... <laughs> Maybe we're moving away from the whole new light uh, sort of idea. And it's all about the way of holiness, this road. And <laughs> every good road needs maintenance. It is so interesting to me that he's talking about Charles Taze Russell. And as I said before, the organization today, he wouldn't even recognize it. He would probably turn over in his grave if... He knew what was being said about him, about his ideas, and what's happened to the organization that he started. I, I don't think he would approve of it by any stretch of the imagination. This guy was obsessed with types and anti-types, and here this guy is like, oh, we're not going to worry about types and anti-types. But it's so funny that they're going to use this, this figure from their history and say, well, he's probably been resurrected to heaven, which... We didn't start thinking, when did they change the idea that people were or have already been started getting resurrected? Was that in the 60s? Was that, or was that more recent? I feel like it was more recent. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. So he's, he's thinking in his mind, yeah, so now that he's resurrected, he's been looking down happy 
with the organization and how it's going. I wonder if you could have asked Charles Taze Russell in 1916 after he had, uh, I mean, I know it's not the great disappointment because that belongs to the Adventists, but his own personal great disappointment. If he had that moment and you could ask him how he felt about the things he taught and this organization and all that. I wouldn't, would he say he was wrong? Would he just adjust it? Would he look and remeasure the great pyramids? Would he double down and say, no, I was actually right? I don't think he would do the double down. I was actually right. Let me just twist these scriptures from what I've read of Russell and, and, and about him. I would think he would say, well, Looks like we got that one wrong. Let's relook into the scriptures and see. But he would at least admit that it was wrong. Whereas Watchtower won't admit they're wrong. They'll just say, well, we needed some maintenance. We were still right, but we just needed maintenance. It's so dishonest. And it's really aggravating. You probably tell from the tone of my voice. So yeah, it is really um, staggering in a sense about how... He can talk about these figures from Watchtower's history in the way that he does because he does know the history himself. And surely there must be a duality that's happening in his mind as he's talking. The way of holiness is open, but maintenance on that way of holiness goes on. And what's the goal? It's to make it as easy as possible for people to identify Babylon the Great and to leave Babylon the Great. That is the goal. Well, take the, take the Bible, for example. There were Bible translations in 1919, but some of them had, uh, were in uh, archaic language that was hard to understand, and most of them didn't give the divine name the place of honor that it deserved. But now we have the New World Translation. What a blessing that has proved to be. It's so clear, and you don't have to mortgage the house to buy a copy which was probably the case in the 16th century. And since 1919, there's been an abundance of spiritual food to make it easier for people to come into the truth. Now just think of this. In 1919, Babylon the Great fell. But what else happened in 1919? What provision did Jehovah make for these people? The faithful and discreet slave was appointed in that same year. And the slave didn't waste any time to start producing literature that was going to make it easier for people to come into the truth. 1919, the slave is appointed. By 1921, you have a brand new publication, The Harp of God. And it was especially designed for beginners and to, to make it easy for people to study and read and come into the truth. And that was necessary because in 1921, there was a shortage of teachers, of, of publishers, who could conduct Bible studies with people. So you really needed something simple. And uh, comparatively speaking, that harp of God was simple. So I first became aware that Bethelites, um, depending on their status and their rank, have access to these archived Watchtower publications that aren't available to the public when my brother was serving at Bethel and he told me about it and he's like, yeah, there's different things. And, uh, depending on, you know, who you are or whatever, you can have access to some of these, this older literature. And it's something that has always bothered me because they will, they, they have the technology. It is completely within their means tomorrow to basically give every single Jehovah's witness access to this publication, the harp of God to have all of the watchtowers way back then it is within their means and yet they don't do it, but they will tell you what you should, you know, find valuable in these old publications. I wonder why that is. Why does David Splain have access to this information, but ordinary Jehovah's witnesses don't what could possibly be the value if everything is above board, if everything is being honest, if every, if there's not playing trickery with how they're quoting these old watchtowers or saying, Hey, this is what R Russell really said, or this is what Rutherford really said in this article. Why not let people find that out for themselves? 
And the fact is, they don't want you to, because as soon as you start looking at what those guys wrote, pretty quickly you'll realize it is not exactly how Watchtower portrays it. And it is wildly different in, in comparison to what they say versus what the person actually said. Which is funny to me because it draws a direct comparison to how he talks about the Bible. He says, oh man, it was so difficult, you know, because, you know, the Bible, you had to mortgage your house to even get one. And it was written in a language that you couldn't understand. How grateful we are that we have the New World Translation now. And this latest version of the New World Translation, as most of you will know, is so watered down and is so filled with a clear examples of them changing the text to meet their doctrine. So never mind what we find in manuscripts, never mind what biblical scholars have to say about these texts that we have available going back as far as we can. Let's, let's build upon the foundation of Jehovah's Witnesses are the one true faith, and then try and make certain scriptures that are difficult to read easier to read. So when he's saying it's easier to read, he's saying, no, we just changed it. We just changed the Bible to fit our doctrine versus our doctrine coming from what the Bible actually says. Wow, a real brain blaster there. Who who in their right mind would form their, their laws, would form their opinions off of original documents? They should just play a game of telephone and say, okay, well, what did that person that spoke to that person that spoke to that person? Okay. Uh, also, I don't really like that, so let's just say the meaning might have gotten lost somewhere along the way because we're playing telephone, even though we don't have to, and it really means this. It really is, it, it is so disingenuous, uh, and I, I can't stand David Splay in, in, in certain ways. I think when I made my governing body tier list, I can't remember exactly where I put him, but this talk alone is really aggravating me. Sorry, I'm excited. I need to calm down. Welcome to YouTube. Now, there were very few publishers in those days, just a few thousand. But they were workers. They did a tremendous job. Do you realize that before the harp of God went out of print, almost six million copies in 22 languages had been circulated? So this is evidence that maintenance work on the way of holiness had begun right after the road opened. Well, I doubt that very many in this audience have come into the truth through the harp of God. Anybody here? I don't think so. What publication brought you into the truth? What publication helped you to identify the way of holiness? Was it, uh, the truth shall make you free? Let God be true? The truth that leads to eternal life? You can live forever? The knowledge book? Enjoy life forever? Teach us? What does the Bible teach us? Or is it our fine new publication? Enjoy life forever. All of these publications have been used to help people to break free from Babylon the Great. And this is proof positive that maintenance on the way of holiness is ongoing. This roadwork continues, and it gets better and better. Well, I guess it's time when we talk about this illustration. <laughs> uh, I'll just use my favorite example, the generation teaching, because it helps us speed run and you don't have to listen to me talk for too long. Generation applies to faithful anointed ones that witnessed the sign of Christ in 1914. The generation now applies to wicked people of Satan's system. Hey, it applies once again to faithful people that witnessed the sign, but we can't really explain why most of them are dead. And now it applies to not only those people, but people that lived at the exact same time. What would that be the equivalent of this maintenance illustration that he's giving? Uh, hey, Bob, I think we should really fix that massive hole in the road because no one can get past it. Okay, no problem. Well, let's fill in the hole. Okay, and then someone else comes along a few years later. You know what? I think we need a giant hole in the road because that's going to... <laughs> That's going to help people 
find find the end. They're, that will help people get to their destination. If a giant hole in the road that makes the road impassable, uh, that will help people get to their destination. Seems reasonable to me, Bill. So then they they go and they dig up the road, and it's it's impassable for a certain amount of time. And then someone comes back. Hey. Uh, it looks like no one's really been able to, uh, get, use this road. It, it's been completely blocked for years now. Let's fill it back in. Oh, okay. So you, they fill it back in and then they come back again and like, you know what? You know where we filled that? Let's just, let's put a detour that takes a giant circle and then ends up right back on the road. Well, why would we do that? Well, because that's the best way. That is the most strategic way that we can get to our destination. What is he talking about? Think about what he's saying. It gets better and better. You're making improvements. Explain to me, Mr. David Explain. Explain to me how you can put in a, a, a road obstacle. You can block the road. How is that better for people? Explain that to me. Email me, call me. I have a number on all of my YouTube uh, descriptions. You can call and I'll answer like 10% of the time. <laughs> Please, if, if, if David Splane calls me problems, I'll answer for him. Holy Moses. I, I just think that this illustration is really silly, but maybe it helps like get the idea of new light because they always like the light keeps getting brighter and brighter. And maybe with this whole maintenance illustration that they're using now, they can sort of say to themselves, well, it's really uh, in improvements that are that are being made. He does say better and better, but, you know, maybe the collective Jehovah's Witness mind will forget about that over time. And they'll just remember, oh, well, they're just doing repairs and it's a pothole and we're still able to drive around the pot. I don't know where he's going with this whole thing, but... My goodness, this illustration is crap. Millions have already taken that road, and it's our hope that millions more will do so before the end of this system of things. And we wish them all safe travels. All right, well, it looks like we'll stop it there because this video is already going on pretty long. So we have David Splain finishing it off with his wild imagination thinking that millions more will will join the call or start walking on this road uh, if millions more do join there'll be children that are baptized at an early age and those people will eventually leave so i'm guessing people like my nieces and nephews they're going to be baptized when they're like eight, nine, ten years old, and then they'll be 18 and realize that it's all a bunch of crap, maybe even earlier, and then they'll leave. So when he says, Mil hopefully millions more will join, yeah, probably you'll have millions more baptisms, maybe before the organization completely dissolves. Well, assuredly before they completely dissolve, just on the numbers. But you're not going to be seeing a millions more increase. I... I will, I, I'm very confident in saying, I don't think that we will ever see the day unless they completely just start cooking their numbers that we can say there that there's 10 million Jehovah's Witnesses in the world. I don't think we will ever see 10 million Jehovah's Witnesses. We probably will never see 9 million and they probably have already hit their peak at this point that they're at, but Hey, Maybe they'll prove me wrong. Maybe they'll water down their whole beliefs and just everyone goes to heaven. Get rid of get rid of the whole paradise thing. I don't know. A lot would have to happen for them to see that kind of increase. And then after I'm done recording, guess who decides he finally wants to sit down and stop meowing and trying to get me to play with his toy, ZZ. Thank you so much, ZZ. It was very helpful that you meowed and clawed me to play this entire video. We appreciate it. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me. I know this has been a rather chaotic episode of the JW Thoughts channel, but we are getting into the annual meeting and it is very chaotic. So what can you expect? Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to drop a like and subscribe to the channel. If you're still watching, 
hey, support the channel. We have a Patreon. We got a PayPal. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. I try and answer as many questions as I reasonably can and call and talk to as many people as I reasonably can. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for all of the support and hopefully the channel just keeps on growing. We will see you next time for part two of the annual meeting. Although there'll probably be a few videos released in between this because this is go going to be quite exhausting to get all these out there. Anyway, thank you guys so much. We'll see you next time.